Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make fans, admirers, churchgoers, volunteers, activists, no. Make kids who love their daddy and want to be just like him. Make apprentices who study every move of the master and orient their lives around honing their craft. Make students who hang on every word of the teacher and go practice what they've heard. Show people what Jesus looked like and challenge them to look like him. Train people who ask, what is God saying? And what am I doing about it? Encourage people who look for what God is doing and ask how they can partner with him. Shape people to be those who desperately want to hear the voice of the shepherd. People who are fiercely loyal and relentlessly faithful to follow. Make people who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good and who are eager to share all they have seen and heard that their joy may be complete. In the end, it won't matter how many people showed up and sat down on Sundays. All that will matter is how many disciples got up and followed the Master. Amen, amen. Good morning, North Dallas. Will you stand with me as we go before the Lord in the reading of his word? I will ask if you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28. And we'll be reading Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 this morning. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. As you're looking, I just want to give God... No, I'll wait until you put your Bibles down for you to give God praise because you can't with your Bibles in your hands. But... Um, Yesterday morning was awesome, and Friday night was awesome. Yes. Eight hours of prayer and praise. Woof. And you guys are still here this morning, right? <laughs> that was awesome to um, actually bring in the New Year fasting for 21 days and then staying up all through the night from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we didn't stop. Uh, like that energizer bunny, right? Just keeps going. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 18, sorry, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20, we all know this passage very well. It reads as follows. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in the heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord have the blessing to the reading of his word. Our Father and our God, we glorify you this day. I pray that your word will illuminate our path, O oh God, that it will illuminate our hearts, that we would shine, as our Savior said, like that city sits, that sits on a hill. Help us not to hide our light, O oh God, but let it show for it that it will illuminate so that the darkness will flee. Father, you call us the salt of the earth. But if the salt shall lose its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Father, help us not to lose our saltiness. I pray that as we go through your word this morning, that you would inhabit not only the praises of your people, but that by the power of your spirit, you would guide our thinking, that we would be conformed to the image of your son, that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so we started off five weeks ago just recapping who we are, the title of the series, This Is Us, just letting um, 
informing who we are because it's always good to go back and to look at who we are, our vision, our mission, and who we stated that, what we stated that God has called us to do. And um, our vision is to be salt and light, meaning to reflect uh, Christ, to reflect um, who God has called us to be through Jesus Christ. And our mission, therefore, is based on what Messiah said, to go out and to make disciples. And so we, sh we went through the seven process, um, the seven pillars that we have here that says, okay, with these seven pillars, this is what demonstrates that we are disciples, right? And the pillar doesn't end because it's one to seven. No, it's a, a circular process, and it never ends. It continues because we continue to grow in each area as our faith grows uh, from faith to faith. And so the first thing we realize is in order to be a disciple of Christ Jesus, one must be saved. And so salvation is the very first point. Because if we're not saved, as Jesus told Nicodemus, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Not only that, he said, we cannot even see the things of God, meaning we can't understand it. And so the Holy Spirit must do something. Again, he told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, um, these things come through water and the Spirit, meaning we must be saved into the body of Christ before we can even start to comprehend the foolishness that is the gospel. Because the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. And we were all perishing. And so the gospel is foolishness. This is why when we look in culture, we see why when we speak of Jesus, some people laugh, some people scoff. Guess what? The Bible says that that was going to happen. Because the message of salvation and the message of the gospel doesn't rock well with the culture that is controlled by Satan. And so we must first be saved. And after being saved, right, as soon as we're saved, we become a part of this, this, this body called ecclesia, better known as the church. And as I've been explaining, the individuals are the church, not a building or a location. The church is the body of Christ Jesus, the bride of Christ. It is not buildings and stuff like that. No, the church is his bride, his people. It's us. And so after becoming a part of the church, we must understand what it means to be the church. It's because most people get saved and then they join a church, not understanding that they are a church, but never understand how to function as a part of church, as a part of the body. So we have hands trying to do what the feet supposed to do. And necks trying to operate like it's the waist. And eyes trying to be the mouth. And the mouth want to direct traffic. So in the church, we go through all those passages that says, love one another, be kind to one another, help one another, be compassionate towards each other, bear with each other. And if we do that, you know in the church that there will be no divorce, there will be no kids walking away from the faith. If we simply allow the Spirit of God to do what Christ sent him here to do within us as the church, we wouldn't have the problems we have. But it's because that fleshly nature is still there. And as Paul says in Romans 7, we are wrestling and struggling. And so the first thing we need to do is be saved. Second thing, as we are saved, we become a part of a body that we need to understand how to function in that body, that is the church. And then in functioning in that body, at the same time and around, again, this is not a step plan, but this is showing that these things can happen simultaneously. But we then develop a prayer and a devotional life. This is where we're um, going before the Lord, praying to God, learning the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting, because this is how we build our relationship with God, through prayer and fasting. And pillar number four, studying the word of God. And so the elementary things, as the Hebrew writer would say, is talking about our salvation and faith and things under dead works, right? So... When we get to studying the Bible, it starts to bridge us now to grow us from just being babes in Christ to now becoming mature. Because a babe in Christ is the one who received Christ as Lord and Savior. They are part of the church, and they're even praying and going to a Bible study. Hear what I'm saying? Going to a Bible study is different than studying the Bible. If you go to a Bible study, you're partaking in the study of the Word of God. But if you study the Word of God, 
And what I mean by that is personally, you're not with anyone, but you're opening the Word of God, and the Word of God guides your thinking. When we go to the Word of God, it's because we woke up that morning not knowing what we should do, so we go to the book. That's studying the Bible. Why? Because if you're not a doer of the Word, applying the Word, and you're just reading the Word, you're not actually a student of the Word. And so studying the Bible is really, as David says, taking the Word and hiding it in your heart. And that's where we get to pillar number five, which is biblical um, worldview, right? So a biblical worldview is when we take the Word of God and we actually apply it to everything in life. We view everything through the lens of God, not through ethnicity, not through economics, not through government, not through friends and affiliations and families and what people think and how people feel, but based on what God says. Now, when we start operating like that, you know, after we're saved and we're a part of the church and we're praying to God and we're studying his word, this will lead us if we're doing, if we truly are saved and we are praying and studying the word of God, it will lead us to have a biblical worldview if we accept what the word of God says. And if we accept what the word of God says with a biblical worldview, it leads us now to becoming what the scripture calls stewards, meaning we understand that everything we have belongs to God. We are the owners of nothing. We're simply caretakers managing all that Messiah left for us in our care. Once we get to that point, there's only one thing left. We start teaching others to do the same. That's called replication. It's the process of discipleship. So as we are disciple, we start discipling others. Now, mind you, that whole process from beginning, someone is always helping us. The church has not learned what it means to make disciples. We did a good job at Converse. This is why we have so many people falling away, especially young people and young adults falling away. It's because we did a good job saving people. Why? Because that's a one-time thing, right? You tell the gospel, you run away. You're done. Discipleship is letting people into your life to see the mess of your life, to see how you handle your difficult situations, to see how you deal with life situations, to see how you respond when someone does you wrong. Notice, Jesus never said when he called the disciples, he never told them, go build me a synagogue because synagogues were there. He never said, go build me a temple, because the temple was there. He said, no, drop what you're doing and follow me. Wait a minute. They became his bedfellow. What? They lived with him. They ate with him. They saw how he responded when people attacked him. They saw what he did when his family came to him, talking down to him. They saw his personal life, his inner life, and all of his issues. They was with him when he, was, when he had to go to the restroom. No, think about that. They were there when he had to take a bath. This was a personal, intimate relationship, life on life. They're walking, but we haven't been taught that because we don't let people into our mess. Sorry, but that's why we're so messed up. We truly believe this life is about us. In your mess, God give you your mess to help someone else out of their mess. Amen. To replicate is to make an exact copy, right? So, so when we say replication, the last process, to replicate is to make an exact copy or to reproduce or, um, or to make a copy of something. So replication is the action of copying or reproducing something. Now here's the thing. Replication is simply discipleship. So when we say replication, we simply means discipleship. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in collaboration with the believer. Notice, the Holy Spirit is in, in collaboration with us as believers, whereby he, the Holy Spirit, enables us to help in the spiritual growth and development of another. I'll say that again. Discipleship or replication is when we allow the Spirit of God to do what he was sent to do in our lives, that we would help someone else in the development of their faith. That's what disciples are called to do. 
What are disciples called to do? Make other disciples. See, it is not cloning, but rather a unique process in the building of the believer. It is helping one in their sanctification to grow in regard to their salvation from milk to meat by demonstrating their love of the Father by, the, by obeying the Son under the direction of the Spirit in bearing fruit. And I said a lot, right? I could grab every scripture I could find to put in there. Why? Because it is the work of the Father. We are supposed to be pleasing to him. It is obeying the Son because we please the Father by obeying the Son. It is under the direction of the Spirit because the Son left the Spirit here to give us the direction and the bearing of fruit. The bearing of fruit is the work of the Spirit. He produces love, kindness, patience, peace, temperance, self-control. He's the one who, when we get out of control, he calms us down. He's the one who, when we're about to make a dumb decision, jumps in and says, no, nah, don't do that. See, that's the work of the Spirit. Notice verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm not actually going to um, exegete this, this passage. I'm just going to focus on the go make disciples. Why? What has happened in Western civilization, the go to us now means send people overseas. The go to us means hire an evangelist to go into the community. Wait a minute. But if this is given to all of us, how does this apply? First of all, how can I get to other nations if I have to work seven days a week? You shouldn't be working seven days a week. You shouldn't even be working six days a week. You should only be working five days a week. Because there's a Sabbath, then there's a day of worship. Do not confuse the two. If we're supposed to be going, how do we go? Hmm. Could it be that we first go to Jerusalem? Now, I've been to Jerusalem. It's nice, but I'm not speaking physically to Jerusalem. I'm speaking metaphorically to Jerusalem in, in, in terms of geographical location. When, when Jesus was speaking, Jerusalem was their immediate context. So should we go first to our house, our family? Are we going to our house? Are we going to our family? Are we telling our children about Jesus? Are we bringing them up in the fear of the Lord? Now, when I say bring them up in the fear of the Lord, I mean bring them up to fear God. So that means as Moses placed in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we must be speaking of God in the morning when they rise, as they're going throughout the day, in the evening when they sit down to the dinner table, and before they go to bed at night. So that means they're supposed to be with us 24-7 because that's what it looks like. Morning, day, evening, night. Whoa. Could it be that we have developed... Don't be sensitive right now. Okay? I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. I'm just stating a fact. If we were living from a biblical worldview, hear me, none of our kids would be in a government institution. People get offended when I say that. From the time of the Old Testament, the instruction to the child to live a godly life was given to the father to bring into the household that the mother would instruct the kids under the father's discipline. To fear God. That's what I'm speaking of. To fear God. When we give our children to Caesar and they come back obeying the Roman government, how can we get mad at them? I'm not talking about teachers. I'm not talking about schools. I'm talking about discipleship. What has become the principle in our lives is getting our kids a good Caesar's education because they're living in Rome. So do like the Romans, right? Become a Roman citizen. 
except that's not our calling. So we emulate the things of the world because we've been taught what our children need to do is go to the best school possible, place them in a good school district, send them off to a good college, oh, by the way, send them to a good school district that are led by secular individuals who would care less about God and they don't seek to train your child in anything of God eight hours a day, five days a week. Whoa. Then give them four more years by sending them to more educated people who can train them even more into hating God because there is no God. And then give them one hour a week or the 168 hours where they come to church. You see how practical discipleship is? You see how practical discipleship is? I say it and folks are now thinking, see, listen, all of us are broken. We've all made mistakes. We've all messed up. No one gave us a book when we, no one gave me a book when I got mar married on, watch this. This is the biblical way to parent and disciple your children. People write about a lot of things and talk about a lot of things, but there is no actual manual on how to. We could talk from our mistakes. Jesus says go. Where do we first go? In our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in to our city. Imagine if every church in DFW would be going. It wouldn't be as messed up as it is. This city is a reflection of the church in the city. And we see in the scriptures, when Paul writing to Corinth, it's like, you know, the Corinthian Christian had a tendency to be more Corinthian than Christian. We have a tendency to be more Latter-day Sayer than we are Christian. We have a tendency to be more Pergamum than we are Christian. We have a tendency to be more e Ephesus, Ephesians, than we are Christians. No, let me break. We have a tendency to be more American than we are Christians. No. We have a tendency to be more black than we are Christians. No, we have a tendency to be more white than we are Christians. We have a tendency to take up these temporal, fleshly things rather than picking up the word of God because this is too difficult for us to do. So therefore, the preaching must be, give me an illustration, crack a joke, come back with one Bible verse, talk about how God loves me so much and he's going to make my life so great and God is going to bless me and bless me, bless me, bless me. Now give me a miracle. Give me some money now. Can I tell you that's why the church is so messed up? Because it's developed an American westernized mentality and then we transport this around the world. What is that? This commercialized thing. It's not about discipleship. It's about people feeling good in sin, coming to hear people talk about, not sin, but the blessings of God. If we would have had a preacher like Spurgeon to come and preach today, no one would attend his church. He might be arrested, depends on where he is. He says, go and make disciples. I have five principles. Of course, as I was going through the five principles, I realized that there are 126 principles. And then when I saw that, it was really 340 principles. So I just say, hey, let me just pull five. Meaning, these five are not, you know, some thing that you take and know, oh, once I do these five principles. No, please don't do that. These are just principles, okay? There are many, many more. Principle number one. Replication or discipleship is intentional. It's intentional. If you are not intentional about making disciples, you will not make disciples. If you are not intentional about being a disciple, you will not be a disciple. It doesn't happen because you say, I love Jesus. I'm sorry, that don't work. I love Jesus, but I wasn't making disciples. Why? Because no one was following me. So you can love Jesus all you want. That's not making disciples. Jesus never said, love me. That is making disciples. No. He says, if you love me, you will do what I say. What? What did you say, Jesus? Go make disciples. Okay. It must be intentional. Watch this. 
He says, go therefore and make disciples. Go therefore and replicate me is what he's saying. As a matter of fact, discipleship is making replicas of Jesus, not of me, not of you, but making replicas of Jesus. This is why in the early church, they were called, watch this, followers of the way. Christian was a derogatory term given to those Christians in Antioch. Why? Because they were followers of the way. In other words, baby Jesuses. Ooh, they sound just like him. They look just like him. When Peter was speaking, they said, aren't you one of his disciples? Peter said, no, but, but you sound like him, though. <laughs> w- weren't you with him? You, y- yes, you were with him. I don't know him. Hmm. It's looking like Jesus, right? So the called ones or disciples must call others into the body of Christ. God uses us um, in the evangelistic process as the mouthpiece of the gospel that his people who have not yet heard would hear him and answer his call. So we are agents at that time being used by the Spirit to call God's people, to call God's sheep into the sheepfold. And we must preach, right? We must go. The purpose of the calling is intentional. It is not, it is to do the will of God. So when God calls us, listen very carefully. This is is hard. God calls us to do his will. This is why people, folks don't even know how to pray. We must pray that God's will be done on earth as it's, his will is being done in heaven. And so if I'm praying God's will and I'm going through something very difficult right now, if I'm going through a marital issue or an issue where my kids have gone off or an issue that I'm dealing with with my boss at work, how do I pray? Father, I do not know how to handle this situation right now. I pray that you would guide me according to your purpose and plan for my life. Help me to make the right decision by the power of your spirit. Give me wisdom. You said if I lack wisdom, you will give it to me. So give me wisdom. Your will be done. Our prayer is supposed to be so focused on God that when we pray, it's all about God's will. Why? Because our life is all about his will. Our life is about his calling on us. As a matter of fact, In John chapter 6, verse 37 and 38, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Listen to this now. Yeshua HaMashiach, Christ the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, he came... God incarnate, God in flesh. When God came in flesh, he submitted himself to the authority of God the Father in heaven. God the Father in heaven gave God the Son, Christ Jesus, an assignment. Jesus came down, he says, I'm not going to do what I feel like doing. I'm going to do whatever my Father purposed me to do. If we are following Christ, it's not about what we feel like doing. It's about what is pleasing to God. What has God called us to do? What has he called you to do? See, because most of us, watch this, when we pray to God, we pray to God for a decision that we have already made or thinking about making. That's how we go to God. I'm sorry. I did that. I did that before I started studying the word of God and understanding it. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. I would want to do something. I would have a decision to make. It's already there. And so now I'm choosing and asking God, watch this. So I'm Jordan, God, Scotty Pippen. I just want an assist. You know we tripping, right? That's how we go to God. Okay, Lord, um, Lord, I really uh, like this job. I really want this promotion. Lord, please help me with this promotion. What? What if we want you to quit? 
and it's the promotion you're seeking. Do you think you will ever go to him asking, okay, Lord, release me from this job? What if that's his will? What if you're praying, Lord, please heal me? But he wants you to go through the suffering. Would you say, Lord, I don't know why I'm in this suffering. If this is for your glory, so let it be. Give me the strength to endure. See, that's a different, see, that's a, that, that's a crazy way of thinking. Who thinks like that, disciples? So Jesus says, not my own will, but the will of the Father. He continues, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that out of all he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So this is God's will. That everyone who place their faith and trust in Christ Jesus will have eternal life. And no one can take that away once he gives it. No one can take that away once he gives it. In 2 Corinthians, I want you to notice what Paul says. Chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. I now rejoice. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of Repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. What? He said that you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. Watch this. So that you might not suffer loss in anything through us, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance. Oh. Could it be that God allows certain things in our lives to draw us to him? This is a, a repentance without regret. Okay. So, this repentance without regret leads to salvation. God's will in everything we go through is always for his will to be done. Even if we're going through sorrow, it is always to bring us to salvation. God's will for us is always to have a saving knowledge of Christ Jesus and to live in that manner. Okay. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, verse 9, and verse 11, I'm, I, I'm going to place verse 5, verse 9, and verse 11 together, and I'm just going to read what Paul says to the church at Ephesians, right? The church at Ephesus. He says, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to his, according to the kind intention of his will. Wait a minute. So you're trying to say that we were preordained to be God's children according to his will. Verse 9. It says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. Whoa. So this is a mystery, God's will that is, that we would be found in Christ Jesus. Okay, this is, watch this. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Wait a minute. So God works things after himself. This is why it's so crazy, because at times, we, we need to understand that God is not about working out the things you think needs to be worked out. His will will be done. If we rebel against him, that's on us. But he has called us and he has a specific plan for us and we are supposed to be following the counsel of his will. This life that we're living, it's a mystery. It was a mystery in the Old Testament. The church was not seen in the Old Testament. Daniel skipped over that. He just 
saw Messiah being cut off and then Messiah coming back. This age of grace, this church age, Paul continuously called it a mystery. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, notice what Paul says, demonstrating that God is the one this calling is intentional. Discipleship is intentional. Watch this. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called on his apostle, set apart for the gospel. He was specifically called as an apostle, right? Set apart for the gospel. And then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, saying, listen, this is God's will. And we know it's God's will, right? You see Acts chapter 9. We see what happened. Jesus knocked him out. Knocked him, well, he didn't knock him, knock him out, but... He appeared in his glorious light and the horse, you know, threw him down or whatever. And he's on the ground and he's blind, can't see, could only see the light, right? So he's blinded and he don't know what's going on. Christ specifically called him. And then we see uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. A again, God called you by his will. Are you going to follow his will? Disciples follows the will of God. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 2, Peter and an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ having been sprinkled with his blood. We were called as disciples to do the will of God, and it's all about the work of God, his son, his spirit in our lives. It's all about God. It's all about God. Okay, so principle number one, replication is intentional. Now, you guys got to excuse me. I'm going to speak very fast from now on. <laughs> principle number two, replication or discipleship is costly. It's going to cost you. Watch what it says. Then Jesus said, this is Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must first deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We know that passage. We read that passage. But do we understand what the passage is saying? Let me add something else to that. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. Jesus says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Hmm. So we're going to be doing renovations on this building. And uh, we have plans to build and to do more things. We're going to do this debt free. We must count the cost. We must count the cost of what it's going to take us to renovate the children's ministry area, the youth ministry area, the sanctuary, the bathrooms. What is it going to cost? And then we're going to calculate, okay, so which one should we do first? Which is priority? And then we're going to say, okay, you know what? Um, how, how are we going to develop this school? Okay, we need more rooms. So how shall we go about building? We'll count the cost. Okay, so how, much, how long would it take us? Why? As a good steward, pillar six, of God, we must manage the affairs of God properly. Listen, if we are a church and in debt, that means we're not managing properly. I experienced that. I walked into that. I walked out of it. Why? Because God word, God's word is so simple. He said this, the borrower is a slave to the lender. We can never get over something unless we get out of it. We must be able to calculate the cost. What is it going to cost me to be a disciple of Christ Jesus? Oh, listen to what Jesus says. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, now my voice is going to change. I, I, I just feel it coming on. <laughs> and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, so stop that. So what is Jesus saying? 
right? Is he saying that I should hate my mom? I love my mother. I love my brothers. I love my sisters. So what does that mean? If any one of them have priority over him, then they are my priority. If any one of them is more important to me than him, then they are my priority. But if in loving my mother, I love her because I'm loving Jesus. Now, how I love her is through the love of Jesus. That means I'm loving her correctly. Not based on how I feel, but based on what God tells me my mother requires to honor and respect her regardless of what she may do. So my love is now unconditional because the love is coming from Christ, not from my feelings or emotions. So he's speaking about priority. Nothing should have priority over him. Why? Discipleship is intentional and it's costly. It's intentional and it's going to cost us something. Principle number three. Discipleship, replication is radical. It is very radical. Okay. So we see radical preaching in Acts chapter 2, right? Um, Jesus told them to wait till the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter started preaching. More than 3,000 people get saved. No, 3,000 men got saved, right? Man, this, this is crazy. What kind of preaching is this? You know, give me that preaching. No, don't give it to me. I don't want that. Right? I don't want that. If God has that for me, may it, so may it be. But here in America, if you find a dude preach, 3,000 people get saved, he gonna build himself a church. <laughs> Hear what I said. He gonna build himself a church. Because he perceived all these people got saved because of me. Whoo! I got the golden tongue. God called me to be a preacher. But wait, no, 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 no. What if he just called you to be an evangelist? Why do you want to preach? How do you know he called you to it? See, it's a good thing to desire the office, but did he call you to it? Wow. Radical preaching. Next thing we see is radical power, right? What's radical power? In Acts chapter 3, right? Everyone came on one accord. The Holy Spirit is present. And everyone started to gather together, and there is prayer, there are miracles, there are healings, all sort of awesome things happening. The blind man at the gate, right? Um, Peter and John, they walk to the beautiful gate, and this blind man is laying there. He asks them for money, and Peter says, no, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, rise up, walk. In the name of Christ the Messiah, get up. This man who never walked a day in his life. See, here's the thing why this power was radical. It's not so much the fact that the man was healed. It's the fact that he didn't need therapy. I don't think you feel me. If you never walked in your life, how do you know how to get up and walk? The, the miracle is more than him having the ability to walk, is him not learning how to walk and getting up out of his mess and walking. But not just that. He never lived anything in his life. Now he's taking up his own bed and walking. Wait a minute. This is, this is, this is next level power. This is that radical power. This is something that's crazy. But here's the thing. Hmm. And here's what we do in Western civilization. Because of the charismatic movement, have distorted things, we believe God's power isn't in existence anymore. So as disciples, we don't even want to see miracles because it will freak us out. <laughs> we truly don't believe God still can do miracles. I just happen to believe that. I believe God can still make the lame walk. I believe God can still make the blind see. I believe God can still raise the dead, physical and spiritual. I believe that God can still do things. However, 
is when we take on the mantle of, well, God called me to be a healer. Go, go to bed. Take a rest. God don't need us. God was only using those individuals in that way to establish the church. If God wants to heal someone, he will heal them. If that is his will, his will will be done. But don't you hinder God's work. If you need healing, you better pray for it. If he don't heal you, that's answered prayer. If he does not heal you, that's his answer. Suffer for him. In the midst of your affliction, cry out to him. Let people know how much he loves you and how much he loves me. Why? Because he's now using that for his glory. Anyway, that's just radical power. A radical conviction. Chapter 5 and 7, right? Being willing to die, right? John and Peter, they're preaching and the scribes and the Pharisees, they come and they, they're trying to stop these guys. And they're like, y'all got to stop. They says, no, they whip them, they beat them, they throw them in prison. Then they release them. Say, y'all better stop. Peter said, listen, 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 listen. Um, we already been in prison, we already got whipped. Y'all might as well do what y'all going to do because we're going to keep preaching. Do you feel like that about Jesus? If someone at your work i.e. your boss, wants you to do something unethical, not God-like, not Christ-like. Are you going to stand on your convictions? <laughs> or are you going to leave your job that God gave you? And he can give you another. What are we going to do? Because folks often ask me the question, Pastor Dames, what should I do? You know what you should do. You just want me to convince you out of it. Why? Because if, if you have the Spirit, he's already convicting you. I'm not the Spirit. If you have him, he's already convicting you. That's why Christ sent him. That's why he's in your life. He is existing in you. If he is in you, he's speaking to you. you you're probably not listening. Listen. He's telling you what to do. It's just too hard. See, that's that radical conviction. And then we see uh, our radical conversion, right, in Acts chapter 8. Um, Philip was just taken to this, this guy from Africa, this Ethiopian eunuch, and he was reading, and Philip just goes to him and explains to him what he was reading, and the guy just says, um, man, listen, baptize me now, right? Baptize me now. Then we see um, in Acts chapter 9, Saul is on the road to Damascus going to persecute Christians, and then Christ stops him, Right? And he have this crazy conversion experience. Never seen another one like it, right? So now Paul gets converted by Christ himself. Whew. That's a radical conversion. And then in Acts chapter 10, we see another radical conversion. So conversion after conversion, but these are all radical. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is moving at this point. He's doing this great work in the church of Christ Jesus. In Acts chapter 10 now, Peter is in one region, Cornelius is in Italy. So Peter is somewhere in Israel, somewhere. Cornelius is in Italy somewhere, or some different region, can't remember. God comes to Peter in a vision. He says, I want you to go to this man's house. His name is Cornelius. Tells him the man's name and everything. He's a Gentile. Peter's a Jew. <laughs> Partiality was rampant, right? Racism, whatever we call it, right? Um, and and I do that not because I, I do that because we call something racism because of ignorance. Again, I would say this over and over: do not take offense. It's a fact. God made one race. That's the human race. What we experience is not racism like there are other races, but we experience partiality where people are bigoted and don't like each other because of differences. That's what we experience. It's called partiality. Read the book of James. It's called partiality. Okay, so here, um, 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 Peter was told to go to this Gentile, and Peter don't know what to do. So in this vision, God showed him all these animals coming down. You know, um, this big platter was coming down from heaven. You know, Peter started to smell it. And what was there was some bacon. Yeah. 
then there was chicken wrapped in bacon. <laughs> and there was, it was a rack of lamb there wrapped in bacon. <laughs> it was just this awesome dish coming down from heaven. And God tells Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, no, I can't eat nothing unclean. God says, how can you say what I made is unclean? And then God explained it. He wasn't talking about food. He was talking about people. Because Peter was a very partial person. And Paul will rebuke Peter for that very thing. Because when he's with the Jews, he pretends to be something. When he's with the Gentiles, he pretends to be something else. So this is a new. Jewish people look down on everyone else. Okay. Cornelius now is a God-fearing man, but don't know Jesus. He's in his house. He gets a vision from God. This man is going to come. When he comes, open your door. Peter gets the vision. Peter now goes to travel to Cornelius. Of course, Peter's probably trembling, but you know Peter. Peter steps up. I came to see Cornelius. Who is this? My name is Cephas. Cornelius opened the door, run, hug Peter. Yo, what's up, man? I had a dream about you. Peter says, I got you. Yeah, I had a dream too. Peter then lays out the gospel. Cornelius and his entire household and all of the soldiers he had under him and their households, everyone got saved. Why? Peter was doing the will of God. And it, it was this radical conversion experience, right? And then we see this radical faith throughout the book of Acts where Paul is going out on all these missionary journeys, being persecuted. He's running. I mean, we see from James uh, uh, being thrown off the temple to Stephen being stoned for preaching the gospel. I mean, and even as he's being stoned, he's saying, you know, in Acts chapter 7, Father, forgive them. But they do not know what they're doing. That's, all, that, that's Jesus, right? As he's dying on the cross, Father, forgive them. And so we see this radical faith taking place. And so we see here, uh, discipleship is intentional, it's costly, it's radical, and then it is a process. Notice, Peter started off as a simple fisherman. He started off as a simple fisherman, right? Uh, Jesus came to him. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men, right? So Jesus told Peter, I will change the trajectory of your life that you, if you follow me, you will maximize your potential by obeying me. So Jesus says, hey, come follow me. And we see uh, Peter growing in the knowledge of Christ as he follows him, and he's growing in a sanctification process. So Peter now, once was just a simple fisherman, Peter, we see the process of growth in Peter. We see where Peter walked out on water when they were in the boat going across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus came walking on the water, uh, Peter says, Messiah, if that's you, call me. And Jesus called him and he walked out. Woo! Walking on water. That was Peter walking on water. And like Peter, <laughs> he had looked at the water. <laughs> and then he sung, but Jesus pulled him up, right? That's Peter. And then we see Peter uh, being rebuked by Jesus. So the man who walked on what is now being rebuked by Jesus, right after Jesus says, you are Cephas, you will be called a rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church. Right? Jesus says, you made this confession that I am the Son of God. Upon this confession, I am going to build the ecclesia. I am going to build my church. Right after Jesus said that, Jesus said, now I must die. Peter immediately says, never. It's not going to happen. And Peter wasn't kidding. He had two swords. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know if Peter had two swords. <laughs> I just know he pulled out one, so I assume he always had one. He didn't just happen to find that sword. Right? So, um, so Jesus rebuked Peter because Jesus had to go to the cross, and Peter didn't understand. So Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. So at one point, Peter's walking on water, lack faith, fell in, Jesus pulled him out. Next second, G, uh, Peter calling Jesus, the Son of God, 
Next second, he tells him he can't go to the cross. Jesus rebukes him. Then we see Peter refused the, to accept Jesus washing his feet. Jesus says, man, if, you don't, if, if I don't wash your feet, you can't be a part of me. Peter said, then bathe me. That's Peter. He's, he's, he's growing. He's, he's not understanding. Now, he's with Jesus, and it's so hard, right? But you're with the master. He's with Jesus, but yet still he's growing in his sanctification. Then we see Peter again. He fell asleep when Jesus was praying in the garden right before he died. Jesus comes to Peter, and Jesus says, man, can you guys stay up for a little while? Can you tarry me for an hour? Praise God, all of you tarried for eight hours, right? Peter couldn't tarry for an hour, right? Man, but listen, Jesus was still working on Peter. The soldiers came for Jesus that same morning. <laughs> and Peter then pulled out his sword, cut the guy's ears off. Jesus said, Peter, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Glued the, air, glued the guy's ears. No. <laughs> he miraculously healed the man place his ear back on, right? See, that's Peter. Now, 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 what Christian would pull a sword on someone, man? They're like, I'm going to cut you. Come on, Peter acting like a thug, like he grew up in third ward or something, man. Peter's like, I'm going to cut you, man. You're touching, you're touching Messiah. I'm gonna... You don't know me? <laughs> then in the same night, in the same night, Peter denies even knowing Jesus three times. As a matter of fact, he cussed one time to say that I definitely don't know you. <laughs> this is Peter. As they took Christ away, they're going to crucify Jesus. He runs away. See, that's the life of a disciple. <laughs> faith, fallen, faith, fallen, faith, fallen, faith, fallen, faith, fallen, faith, fallen, right? But listen, but never falling away. Because Christ always comes back. He always comes back. Okay, Cephas, feed my sheep. Cephas, feed my sheep. See, first feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? <laughs> you know how I feel, Lord. That's us. <laughs> a disciple isn't a perfect person. A disciple is one who goes through ups and downs in life, Sometimes displays faith, sometimes not. But always trust in Christ. But always trust in Christ. So Jesus chooses Peter. He, he challenged Peter. He confronted Peter. He changed Peter. He cared for Peter. He's doing the same for us. He chooses us. He challenges us. He confronts us. He changes us. He cares for us. See, that's who Jesus is. And that's who we are called to be as disciples of Jesus Christ. We are called, those who Jesus has called, when we preach the gospel, they hear. He brings them. He challenges them. He confronts them. He changes them. He cares for them through us doing what he said. So we see replication is intentional. It is costly. It is radical. It's a process. And finally, it's rewarding. So I, I have to end with this great reward. Notice this. Colossians chapter 324, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. What? Watch this right here. Hebrews chapter eleven six, 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. He rewards us for the life that we live in him. Okay, this right here. Second John 8. Watch yourself that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you will receive 
a full reward. There is this expectation of every disciple that at the end of our race, at the end of the journey, there is something better. There is this great reward. This is why we live the life we live because we believe in what Christ said he's going to do at the end of the age. What did he say he's going to do? I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked, right? Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged. And the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroyed the earth. I'm just saying this. God is coming back with his reward for all of his faithful stewards who have been faithful in that which he has given for every single one of you in this building this day who are disciples of Jesus Christ. Even though it's hard, even though you struggle, continue to tarry. His reward. You will see blessings on the side of glory, but his reward is yet future. And his reward is going to come. So our process, once we're saved, we become a part of ecclesia, a part of the body of Christ. We start to develop this personal, intimate prayer life with God. We start to read and study his word. And then his word becomes the lens through which we see everything in the world. And then we realize that our life and everything we have in life belongs to God. So now we seek to manage according to to his word and then we turn around to find someone else to help them to do the same to help them through that process Revelation chapter 22 verse 12 behold I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done our savior he is coming and he's going to give us all that which we rightly deserve. Replication is intentional. Replication is costly. Replication is radical. It's a process. And it's rewarding. So all disciples of Jesus Christ, he has called us to do a work. He has called us to live in such a way that the world would see and know that there is a God. He's called us to go, to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to teach them to do all that he has commanded. See, that's the part. Making disciples requires baptizing them, and then teaching them to do all that Christ commands. Now, Christ commands a lot, so that means it's going to take some time. But then he says this, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for being with us throughout our lives. Father, even to the end of the age, for those whom you have called. I thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. I thank you for this body of believers. I thank you for your church. I thank you for your church local, for your church universal. I pray, O oh God, that by the power of your spirit, you will enable us to stand firm on your word of truth. We know that there are tares among the wheat. Help us, O oh God, to be like the Bereans. Father, we know that wolves come in sheep clothing. Help us to be able to discern, O oh God. Father, I pray that you would protect us, but you would help us to do what you've called us to do. Let us not be timid, for you have not given us a spirit of fear. Let us stand firmly on your word of truth, and let us boldly proclaim the gospel of Christ Jesus to your glory. Amen.